Hit it. Welcome to the Test Talks Podcast, the place to go to geek out on software testing. And now your host, whose mission is to help you succeed with test automation, Joe Colantonio. Hey, it's Joe, and welcome to another episode of what's going to be in a few weeks officially the Test Guild Automation Podcast. So I'm rebranding everything. More on that coming up in a few weeks. But today, we're going to be talking all about finding your community at meetups with Julie Larson, Joel Hendershot, and Evan Nevajavlo. So if you're a new test automation engineer or test engineer in general, and you really want to put yourself out there but aren't sure how to contribute or where to go, maybe you're a lone tester in your organization and having to seek out support outside your company because you're the only one there, no one knows what the heck they're doing. Or maybe you're just trying to build some community yourself from scratch, either within your organization or in your area. If so, this episode is for you. Joel, Julie, and Evan will share some lessons learned, tips, and pain points based on their experience in creating communities and meetups from scratch. You don't want to miss this episode. Check it out. Test Talks is sponsored by the fantastic folks at Sauce Labs, the cloud-based automated testing platform that eliminates the need to maintain your own Selenium grid and test infrastructure. Try it for free today. Visit testtalks.com and click on the Sign Up Now link under the Homepage Sponsor section. Hey, Julie, Evan, and Joel, welcome to Test Talks. Hello. Hey, thanks for having us. All right. I think it's the first time I actually interviewed three people at the same time. So really quick, like a one or two sentence. Let's just go around the room and just tell us a little bit more about each one of you. So uh, let's start with you, Julie. Hi, uh, so my name is Julie Lorson, and I am a QA um, professional at Keller Williams here in Austin, Texas. And um, I met Joe through a uh, convention we have in Austin called SoftCon, and I was presenting on our meetup, which is Austin Automation Professionals. Cool. Um, I'm Evan Netajadlo. I'm currently a test manager in engineering at Pedal.com, actively working on DevOps these days, <laughs> so a lot of Kubernetes, Terraform, et cetera. Um, also a coordinator of Austin Automation Professionals, and that's it. And uh, I'm Joel Hendershot. I'm the test architect at ESO Solutions. Um, we're all here in uh, Austin. Um, I've been kind of test and test automation for 11, 12 years now. Yeah, I've had the opportunity to go to like development and just I just have always loved tests, so I've stuck around here. Very cool. So you all sound like very busy people. It's not like you have uh, simple jobs. So first question is, what makes you want to even be an organizer at, at a meetup? But what got you all involved into it? Um, so I joined a little bit late to the game because I was in a time frame where QA was moving from manual to automated in Austin. And it was getting to be very, very difficult to find a job if you weren't already in software development. Um, so this was my way of uh, joining as an organizer uh, was my way of getting more involved in the community and trying to make you know, more connections, network with more people, and learn more about the skill sets that I needed. Um, for myself, it was you know a long time, like 2015. I went to a, a meetup, uh, Soft Labs, I believe, hosted it over at Will Shark Media, um, now known as Retail Me Not, and I was just kind of you know totally new to the automation space. You know, I was mostly in exploratory testing. And, you know, it just kind of blew my mind, you know, and I, I just utilized, you know, that community, uh, this podcast, um, and a couple of additional resources and, uh, just figured it was, a, you know, later in my career, uh, it was a good time to give back to the community, um, and provide, you know, that content in, in a place for everyone to, to really, to go really. For myself, I was, um, the reason why I kind of got involved is I was working for Realtor.com for several years, uh, completely remotely uh, as one of their uh, test leads and was traveling a lot, but I had no connection to the test community here in Austin. Uh, and so I was going a little bit stir crazy because it was just me at home with wife and kids and all that, getting cabin fever. And so how I kind of got started in this is uh, we were part of the Selenium uh, meetup here in Austin and somebody posted uh, that they were going to have one, but they didn't have a time frame or anything. And so I was like, well, I was renting a co-working space. So I said, hey, I'm going to host it. Uh, I don't know anything about any of you, but you can come here at this time uh, and 
basically hosted it. They showed up and everybody was expecting me to go over or somebody to go over Page Factory and they were looking to me to uh, like just run it. And I was like, I don't, I'm just hosting. I have no idea about any of that stuff about Page Factory because we weren't using it. And so uh, basically I had some material that I had presented to our teams. And so I presented that and that's how Evan and I uh, got hooked up and all those meetups were completely dead. And so we just decided since we had like 30 people um, head up to like 40 minutes north of Austin, Austin proper uh, to show up to a Selenium meetup. I mean, it was very clear that there was a need for that community in Austin. Uh, and so Evan and I talked more and that's when we kind of came up with this idea and started rolling forward. Very cool. And that's actually one of the things Julie brought up in her session was um, a lot of times you go to a meetup and it's dead. No one's there or uh, it was scheduled ahead of time. So do you usually start off with, okay, it's dead, so we're just going to start up a brand new meetup? Or is it, how, how do you know like who's already part of the meetup so you can reach out to them and say, okay, we have new organizers and we're going to do it uh, a better way that's more efficient? Meetup will pretty much do it automatically. Um, if, yeah, if you, take out, if you take over a meetup, it's all done through email and you'll just agree to take it over through that email and then meetup will send another email to all of the existing members. And you can look into, just go on meetup.com and if you click on a group, you can see who and who is and who isn't a member. Yeah, and then I, the thing with getting the information out there, because if you look around, you see all these dead meetups. Um, and I think one of the things that people look for is consistency. Um, so one of the things that Evan and I, and we had another gentleman uh, who was with our current sponsor, Austin Fraser, uh, the recruiting company here. Um, one of the things that we kind of landed on is that we needed one every single month whether we had something or not, like we have to host, we have to be there. Um, and that's one thing that we have done consistently since November of 2017 is we have had a meetup every single month. Um, and we try to keep it consistently on the same day. So we do the last Thursday of every month. Um, and that has basically helped us build kind of a rapport with our community. So even if we have a, you know, a, a company sponsor, like we had uh, Apple tools in, um, twice we've had, um, uh, individuals from our community doing presentations. We've even done just like um, lean coffee chats where we all kind of write down the things we want to talk about and then just kind of put those out there to the group. Uh, and so I think the key there is having a consistent community so that they know that you're going to be there month after month and consistently be the content month after month. Um, so actions speak louder than words, basically. So you're the you're the organizers. How, how does it not become like the Joel meetup or the Julie meetup or the Evan meetup, where where people just assume that the organizer not only is going to organize it but also is going to give a presentation? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we we have a Slack group and we see, you know, we maintain communication throughout that Slack group. Um, there's like this admin channel, and we just kind of share ideas. You know, oftentimes someone reaches out to us. And as opposed to just saying, oh, I'm going to create this meetup page, we, we all collaborate together on it and we determine like, yeah, this is, this is good for the community or yeah, it's a vendor, but you know, perhaps they should do a talk associated with what they're trying to sell. Um, so that's, that's just how we've been doing it. Um, and it's worked out, I'd, I'd say fairly well, you know, and there's, to be honest, like there's not, there hasn't been an, an enormous amount of effort. It's essentially, you know, we run this meetup, a, a lot of people reach out to us or we think of an idea that we want to talk about. Um, and we just post it and communicate it within Slack. So it's been really helpful because, you know, there, we can't meet up within ourselves like all the time. So, you know, Slack's helped out a lot there. Um, and another thing I brought up in my talk was talking with the different members in your community. It's really important when someone says something interesting that could be a talk, having that mindset of listening to what they're working on and knowing what would be a good talk and then encouraging them to submit it, or even if they don't want to submit it as a full talk, saying, hey, that would be a great lightning learning five-minute speech. Can you just talk to us a little bit? So, Julie, that's a great point. A lot of times um, you, you may notice someone has uh, a skill set in the audience and you think we make for a great speaker, but they may think that they don't have any skills or they're afraid to talk. So how do you encourage people to get over this imposter syndrome? Um, it's important to tell them that they're not alone in what they're feeling. Um, a lot of people think that maybe their ideas are a little overdone or just because they're used to it, they're living in, you know, their ecosystem and they talk about the same thing at work every day, but they don't really know what everyone else is going through. 
Um, so I think it's important to say, hey, like you don't have to be alone in feeling this, and you also don't have to be alone in presentation. We can present with you. The three of us can collaborate on, on putting together the talk. Um, you can be part of a series of talks. Uh, there's multiple different ways to present your idea, and it doesn't always have to be just you speaking at length for 60 minutes. Yeah. You know, it's funny, uh, Joe, that you bring that up because just before we got started here, we were talking about a gentleman that we know who sent some emails out was asking for people to contribute to their like, testing and DevOps site. And, uh, and I was actually saying, like, I don't think I have anything like particularly interesting to talk about. You know, like, even though like, I do stuff that's different than what Julie's doing and what's different than what Evan's doing. Like, I think we all have that to a point. Like, we look at what we're doing and we see, like, kind of the great strides that are being made in tests. And we almost feel like the, the small thing I'm doing right now can't help somebody else. But it really can. Uh, and even at that point, like, both Evan and Julie were like, oh, well, why don't you try this? Well, why don't you try that? Right? And so I think that part of that is... Um, uh, getting to know your community, like I think we spend a lot of time, with, we as organizers are the last people to leave our meetups, mainly because we just kind of sit around for an hour, sometimes two <laughs> afterwards, and just talk with people in our community and get to know them. Uh, and so I think that that has helped a lot in building that strong kind of community culture. And then to piggyback on both of their answers, um, we have lightning talks as well, where, you know, if someone's not comfortable speaking for a long period of time, you know, we just open it up, you know, and lightning talks help out a lot where, you know, we want people to not only talk about tasks and automation and, and DevOps related items, but also culture, you know, what, you know, what particular issues they're going through, uh, you know, whatever they want to talk about, really, like we want to open it up to, to new speakers, particularly. So I guess the next issue I could see, I, I've run online conferences and a lot of times it's hard to uh, juggle whether a track is going to be beginner, intermediate or advanced. And a lot of times I think we suffer for curse of knowledge, especially I think everyone here has over five years experience. How do you know, like, I guess, like you said, know your audience, know, know your meetup. Uh, how do you know, like, when it went to us, a topic may seem like, oh, everyone knows that, but maybe everyone doesn't know that. So how do you know what, at what level to, to the presentation should be uh, presented at, I guess, the question? So on, on occasion, we'll have, you know, a, a survey, right? So sometimes we can utilize uh, a survey with a meetup to identify, you know, kind of the, and get a feel for really what the audience is, is, you know, what the audience is. So for instance, me and Evan were at a different meetup, not our own meetup on Monday. And there was a spreadsheet that the organizer sent yeah. out to everybody in the community. So already before he even started the discussion, um, we knew that everybody in the room had a minimum. It was a DevOps meetup. So everyone had a minimum of five years experience in tech. Um, so that kind of gave you a platform to jump off of. Um, and for us, we, we don't send out as many surveys. We definitely don't send out a spreadsheet at, before every single meetup. Um, but we have a really tight community. And like I said, we have a Slack channel. So we generally know where people are. Uh, we get a lot of mid-level and senior people, in, especially in Austin, just because of the demographics of Austin. Um, but that doesn't mean that we also don't occasionally have beginner meetups. We just try to tailor it to where people who are at that mid and senior level won't be bored. So one of the things that we tend to do is I, I do think we err on the side of uh, going a little bit more shallow uh, with especially the presentation of our content. Uh, we had a good meetup on uh, Cyprus and we, we went through it really, really fast. It was fairly shallow uh, as far as like kind of the depth, the technicality of it, I guess. Um, however, one thing I always notice is the people who are there who are more technical will always get something out of it because like we will have 30 minute question and answer sessions where people like get really deep and start grilling on it. So it's interesting because the stuff, the slides that we send out and the stuff that people get at the beginning, is actually pretty good for uh, kind of beginners and lower intermediate uh, folks because they can actually see it and kind of digest it. And then you have those kind of heavy hitters in the back of the room that at this point, like they don't throw softball questions at you, right? Like they are going to nail you with kind of hard questions and deeper things and make sure not, not to like see if you know your stuff, but like they're genuinely interested in that. Uh, and so it kind of plays to a little both sides of the field. I do think that we, we as a community need to look at those people who are more senior in our organization and start tailoring some of our content towards that because I've noticed that a lot of it was on the, intermediate and lower side. So like 
I, I do think that that's important to kind of gauge that and every once in a while have something that has a lot of technical depth and technical meat to it. But I will say that like when we do stuff that's super uh, junior, those are our largest meetups. Those are when we have a hundred plus people in the room. Mm-hmm. And logistically, I just want to say, um, I talk a lot a bit about in the speech that I did at SauceCon about when and where to do it. Um, if you have a nighttime evening meetup with enough time for networking at the beginning and Q&A at the end, I feel like those have more opportunities to get in depth than having lunchtime meetups. I've been to a lot of lunchtime meetups with another group in Austin. Um, and it just ends up being shallow based on everyone's at lunch and they have 50 minutes to do it and leave. And that's, that's another difficult thing with meetups as well is like just, you know, creating the meetup so that it abides by, you know, everybody's time, you know, so some people might have families that, that they have to you know, go to. And then, you know, so doing meetups in the evening has kind of been our thing. Um, but definitely something for us to look into is like, you know, potentially we could do some lunchtime meetup or something like that as well, just to uh, cater to everyone. Now, we talked about why you, you, you all decided to start organizing meetups and, and being involved. But, you know, at a high level, why, why do you think community is important, especially if someone's been working all day? Like you said, like, wh- wh- why should they care about, oh, now I have to go to this other place to, to, to hear a talk on what I did all day? Oh, for, I mean, for me, this hits me, you know, personally. Like, I mean, I was the only pastor at my company for quite a long time. And, you know, when I had gone to that Sauce Labs meetup in 2015, it was like so mind blowing that, you know, I just wanted to learn this stuff. And for me, it was a matter of, you know, learning, but I guess it's like self learning, but it's really not because I had a community that I could fall back on and, you know, a podcast and, you know, just Stack, stack Overflow, et cetera. I mean, there's, there's just a lot of options for me specifically to, to learn, you know, and I, I think like for a lot of people who are out of their companies and they're like the sole pastor or like sole SDAT, you know, whatever they might be, uh, Meetup provides a space for them to go not only talk about what they're working on, but to also identify, you know, what stacks other companies are working with. Um, I think that was really helpful for me and I, I would hope helpful for other people who are in the, who are in the same situation. I also think it's because we're super cool. Like, <laughs> but I mean, so one of the things with, with that is like in tests, a lot of times, uh, especially if you are kind of siloed on a team where you have, um, whenever I first started in QA, like we had large test teams and those test teams were separate from the dev teams. And so we could kind of collaborate and we could, you know, misery loves company as they say, right? So when things are going sideways, like we have those people to fall back on. A lot of times what I found is as we move towards these um, kind of vertical teams, we have embedded testers on the teams. And at our organization right now, we don't even have the same reporting structure. All of our testers report to different people. And so you can start to feel kind of fractured uh, from your community. And a lot of times it feels like well, the devs and the managers and people just don't get you, you know, uh, in the test side of it. And so I do think that um, there is a lot to kind of handle mentally uh, in the test side because you're consistently trying to to find bugs to show kind of quote unquote issues uh, and try and get those fixed. And, you know, sometimes you want people to go together with and, you know, if you're struggling with something, you don't necessarily have anyone with expertise in your organization. We have people that just come and talk shop. Uh, if you want somebody just kind of to commiserate with, you know, a little bit and they know kind of what's going on because we've all kind of been in the trenches, like when we're especially learning automation, uh, when we're dealing with, you know, Selenium and objects that don't exist and we can't find them and all kinds of stuff like that and flaky tests, the whole bit. Like there are so many of us that have fought that fight and an individual, especially kind of a lower intermediate tester has not dealt with those yet. And so they, I think it will help with that kind of imposter syndrome to see that there are other people out there that have kind of been in the trenches and done those things. So I do think that we provide that kind of space for them to kind of find the people who are kind of in a similar place to them. Yeah. And um, I had my long answer at SauceCon, but also just this week, going back to that one meetup we had as an example that me and Evan went to on Monday, um, there was just one little nugget where the he was the hiring manager, DevOps hiring manager that was leading it. And he pointed at the spreadsheet and he said, we have one QA person here and they're making 90,000 and everybody else is making over a hundred. 
what is wrong with this picture? You guys in QA are the original automators. You're the people who were doing automation before DevOps. You should be getting paid the same, if not more. So hearing that from someone who is in a hiring role high up in this company at the director level um, is pretty validating to hear, especially, you know, I've, I've worked for some bosses who really clamped down on salary, really clamped down on titles and would never say anything that encouraging. So Julie, uh, also you went over some do's and some don'ts and also some optionals. I thought it'd be kind of fun to get each one's uh, opinion on all those. So the first one is do's. So if you're running a so someone's listening to this like, this sounds awesome. I want to do exactly what they're doing. I want to be an organizer. So are there any dues you think all meetups should have? Uh, yeah. A few of them were location um, is very important. You want to go to where your base is. So if you have a lot of people working in one area of town or that are free at a certain time, even though it might be a little bit inconvenient to you, Prioritize a group as a whole over yourself as an organizer and make it easy for them to go to. Um, one of them was find a sponsor. So we have a sponsor named Austin Frazier. That's a recruiting company in town. Uh, they provide pizza and beer for our meetup. Well, pizza, I guess, for our meetups. And um, it, having food helps a lot. Uh, number one thing is location for me. Number two is food. It also just helps to have a champion. You know, those people as recruiters run into QA people all day and they just throw it in the side. Hey, by the way, there's a meetup going on tonight. And that's how one of the reasons how we've been able to get our numbers so high. I think Jolton talked about consistency. So um, I, I said have a meetup at least once a month. It doesn't necessarily have to be at the exact same time and place, um, but for consistency, we do try to have it on a Thursday, the third Thursday of every month. Um, but you can throw in extra meetups. Just always try to have a core meetup. So maybe have a social around it. Maybe have like a happy hour. Um, maybe you know, I was doing a book club for a while. I didn't need to bring that back. Um, but throw in things just to keep it on top of mind for people. And then have your base like monthly meetup that is at the same, same time and place. One thing that I would also add to that is understand the value that this community can bring to each other and to, especially when you go to look for those sponsors. Like right now, we have to turn sponsors away uh, because they want to get their names in front of people, right? So a lot of times it can be pretty daunting and, well, how do I, how do I get space? How do I, you know, make sure there's food for people? How do I make sure that there's drinks or whatever? We have not had an issue with that. Um, so I will say that if you're going to go ahead with this, get a couple of folks together and understand your worth and what you bring to the table when you go to one of those sponsors, uh, because that will help tremendously. My piece is uh, just make everyone feel welcome. You know, it's, it's a very, so, it's a social event. You know, you, people leave work, they're, they're showing up to this meetup and it's just one of those things where, you know, just, just talk to everyone. You know, I've been to meetups where it was just me, myself and I. <laughs> You know, and, and like at our meetup, I, I really make an effort to, to try and talk to any, everybody. You know, even if somebody's not in task, QA, DevOps, whatever, you know, if they're looking to get into the industry, you know, it, it's great just to get a chance to talk to them and, and just to kind of show them a potential path forward. So it's just kind of how I, I've really enjoyed that doing this. Awesome. Great advice. So that was the positive. How about don'ts? Is there anything you think that, oh man, why, why, why do people do this at meetups? It really turns people off or it really doesn't help. Uh, get the discussions going or something. Any don'ts? I mean, for myself, just don't, you know, for, for drinks, I know this is a crazy thing is not every meetup is sponsored, but just, just don't always only have beer, like have options. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it sounds crazy, but it's like one of those things where, I don't know, just so many, so many people often forget that. Just, just have uh, just a variety of options available for, for everybody. I think one of my biggest things is don't be discouraged. A lot of people quit meetups really early. Um, there's a lot of meetups that are always getting kicked off and then, and then pulled pretty quickly when people see that there's only five or ten people. But you got to keep in mind your long-term goals. You're never going to get 100 people to every meetup right off the bat. You have to build to that. Um, and then the other thing I mentioned in my presentation is not doing it on a single framework or tool. Um, if you call it just a Selenium meetup, now Cypress turns into, you know, the new hot thing and no one's going to come to that because it's the Selenium meetup. If you have a QA meetup, then it includes both those things. And one thing that I would say that um, we kind of fell into this at the beginning, uh, but don't just bring external companies in. Uh, so we had a couple of folks come in, a couple of companies come and do presentations. 
And we were expecting really technical discussions, and it was kind of their marketing sales guy, that, that, you know, the general one that you kind of see at a conference or whatever that can't ask those technical questions. And those were by far our weakest meetups uh, that we've had. Uh, we have had, when Apple Tools came out, I'll say that they did a fantastic job. But some of the other ones that we had kind of, I think, put us all off on bringing in companies that were kind of using it to market uh, because they weren't really bringing value to the table, to the community as a whole. They were just kind of hawking their product. So I would, it's not necessarily bad if you need a filler space, but just be careful on how many of those you bring in. That's a great point. So usually are these recorded and then it's streamed or is it just an all, all on-site event uh, for people that are like introverted like I am, which would, would freak me out? Um, uh, we are all on-site right now, but we intend to record and have more options in the future. Um, one thing I find interesting is a lot of people don't take advantage of open source projects, even contributing to, say, documentation. Even though they're not getting paid, I heard of a lot of people getting opportunities based on that that they never would have had if they never contributed to that open source project. So I'm assuming a meetup's like that. I know, Evan, you're a manager. Like, Do people sometimes get hired that they wouldn't have got hired if they never went to the meetup? Or, Julie, were you able to get the um, the speaking spot at SourceCon because you you, you organized a meetup? Like, what, are there any like benefits you've seen from that? You know, I I got the SauceCon gig because I met my friend Evelyn at a party and she was working at Oracle and she absolutely hated it. And she said that someone from Sauce Labs had reached out to her and she wasn't going to talk to them and she never heard of the company and she was just going to continue being miserable at Oracle. So I freaked out on her and said, you have to work for Sauce. <laughs> um, for myself, uh, I mean, it definitely helped my career. You know, I, I couldn't have gone anywhere without a community. You know, it's like, like I said, once again, this idea of like t- just being self-taught and all that. I mean, realistically, it's just for me and then, you know, having a community to bounce ideas off of, to talk to them about, uh, find mentors. I mean, it's just one of those things that's just helped me a lot. I mean, now, especially because I'm mostly working on, on DevOps history type items these days. And I'm just repeating the process. Like I'm going to DevOps meetups and, you know, discovering all these books and resources uh, just through the community. And it's it's helped me in my current career and my upcoming career. Do you guys have the Austin Fraser staff, though, on how many people got hired through them? Uh, I don't know. I know that they made a tremendous amount of money last year. Yeah. Um, it, it made so a lot. <laughs> one thing that I will say for us is that's my primary recruiting pool. Like when we are looking for uh, testers and, and new folks for our organization, which we have had several in the past few years, uh, past year and a half or so, I will actually use that as kind of my primary place to go look for, for people who are really hungry because that's what, um, you know, as a person who's higher up in an organization and kind of leading teams and stuff, I want people who are hungry. I want people who are, who are putting out the effort. You know, those people, we had a, part of our team for a long time, we couldn't even get to show up to the meetup and it was in our space. Like they'd walk through the group, like leaving, right? So it was, it's interesting, right? Uh, Because those are not necessarily the people who are going to move the needle uh, for your organization. It's the person who's going to make the time to go to those, um, those meetups and try and learn and kind of have those discussions. So I'm going to use that as kind of my primary uh, bed of recruiting. Also, one of the things that we did is because we brought in um, uh, Austin Fraser, we had their QA person was spending a lot of time with us and in our meetup. What that did for them is it actually got them kind of the ability to to really understand QA and what we do. And so when that person would interview candidates for us, I had so much more trust in that individual because they know the space, they know what we need and kind of what we do. And so it actually added a lot of credibility to both the candidate and the recruiter. Um, and so for hiring, as far as my side of the organization, it has been a tremendous boost for us. Yeah, I just want to mention, like, Austin Fraser, how interesting that is, because I, I hadn't seen any other recruiting organization that actually embedded, you know, their recruiters in, in the local community within meetups, you know, something that I think all recruiters should, should consider. I mean, they have, you know, recruiters involved in the DevOps community here, you know, Golang, JavaScript. So there, there's, it's really interesting to see that. And I, I think it's hugely beneficial for them. Also, they're not paying for us right, for this right now or anything. Like, yeah, we, just, yeah, totally. we just have 
so much respect for that organization yeah. because of how well they've taken care of us. <laughs> so <it> just <laughs> well, I know we're talking about that a lot, but we, I mean, I don't know. We just they, to... But they made their money back. They hired a lot of people to meet up. Yeah. So people definitely got hired. So Julie, uh, before we go, best way to contact you? For me personally, it'll be julie.lorsen, and that's L-A-U-R-S-E-N, at kw.com. Awesome. How about you, Evan? Uh, Twitter, um, definitely E, uh, Neto Jadlo, so that's E-N-I-E-D-O-J-A-D-L-O. I'm not incredibly active on Twitter, um, but I'm going to start writing on randomthoughts.io, specifically about ops. And you, Joel? Uh, so you can email me at uh, joel.tendershot, H-E-N-D-E-R-S-H-O-T-T at ESO.com, uh, or uh, just look me up, Joel Houston Hendershot on LinkedIn. Um, I'm pretty, I don't post a lot there, but I'm always active and talking with people there. Thank you, Julie, Joel, and Evan for your meetup automation awesomeness. For links to everything of value we covered in this episode, head on over to testtalks.com forward slash 264. And while you're there, make sure to click on that sign up for a free trial link under the exclusive sponsor section to learn all about Sauce Lab's awesome products and services. And as I mentioned, stay tuned for a big announcement and a new logo reveal for the rebranding efforts I'm doing to make things easier and simplified here currently at Test Talks and JoeColantonio.com. So that's it. For this episode of Test Talks, I'm Joe, and my mission is to help you succeed by creating automation awesomeness. As always, test everything and keep the good. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Test Talks podcast. Head on over to www.testtalks.com for full show notes, amazing blog articles, and other automation awesomeness.